everyone welcome to podcast number 464 today i am joined by mr nathan welton he is the founder of the wolf rentals and uh, today we're going to talk about how we can uh, how we can leverage our, our airbnbs and our airbnb business to create a uh, a positive change in our communities so super excited to uh, to talk about this nathan has some really good ideas so Nathan, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, I gotta, I gotta ask you first. The Wolf Rentals. <laughs> That's a cool name. Like, tell us the backstory of that. So I, uh, I live in a national park community. Um, we actually don't have wolves in my national park community, but you know, it's it's got this animal vibe to it. But really, it's named after Harvey Keitel's character in Pulp Fiction. Um, when John Travolta shoots Marvin in the face, I think it was John Travolta who shot this character Marvin in the face and they got blood and guts and gore all over the back seat of the car and uh, they call in the wolf to fix the problem. And Harvey Keitel shows up and he says, hi, I'm Winston Wolf, I solve problems. And, you know, I don't know, as an Airbnb host, you see a lot of things going wrong. And so I became the wolf because we, oh. we solved problems. <laughs> Wow, that's that's hilarious, man. Pulp Fiction was like my favorite movie for so really? long. I watched it. I I think I watched it like fifteen times. We actually had uh, in our. This is back when I was uh, in university. Some of our, our our little student group, like we we had a couple of years where we were basically talking to each other in Pulp Fiction quotes. You sent in the world. <laughs> Damn, that's all you had to say. <laughs> yeah i love that man i uh i think that's awesome yeah uh yeah it's like uh hey i'm mr wolf i solve problems and then the other guy goes like great i got one <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome man like tell us uh tell us a little bit more about your markets and and what type of units you, you have and yeah so like i said it's national park town um it's estes park colorado so it's rocky mountain national park we got 5 million visitors coming through this little area a year. And it's a unique place because it's, you know, geographically contained. So you can't grow any bigger. You can't grow out. Mm. You really can't grow up either. Um, so we have, um, yeah, we just, we just have a ton of people and they come here because of our mountains, because of the park, you know, because of our nature. And, um, and that's why I moved here. So I oversee 32 units of various sizes, you know, from studios to like luxury cabins. Um, yeah, I've been doing this since 2016. I got into it in 2016. Oh, what made you get started with Airbnb? Uh, I, you know, I've, I've got a really weird background. I, I'm actually a, a science writer originally. I have a, you know, background in science journalism. So I did that for a while. Then I became a wedding photographer and moved to the woods. Um, and then in 2016, I just had a guy living in my basement who moved out and I was like, let me just see what I can do with an Airbnb. And so I grew, you know, I, I started that. And I remember this guy, the very first guest I had gave me one star and it was one of those mistakes, you know, where he thought the one star rating was the best one and not the five star rating. And I'm just like, man, that's a bad way to start this whole thing. Um, <laughs> left this glowing review and one star. I'm like, ah, but, um, you know, I, I had the first guest, I listed it on August 2nd, first guy came in August 3rd, and then I didn't have a vacancy until after Halloween. And I was like, whoa, I, you know, I'm onto something here. And so, you know, for the next years, I just reinvested every dime I made back into, you know, new units and got to the point where I couldn't really manage it anymore. So I started a management company to deal with my units. And then, um, you know, and then we just grew on and took on a lot of other, other places as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really uh, it's really interesting how almost everybody in our community and and especially also in our you're one of uh, our mastermind members, uh, right? Which uh, it's going to be exciting to see you in in Mexico in in, in June, but um, the, n no one like like started this business with uh with the with the business in mind. It was always like, oh, I I you know I got into I heard about this Airbnb. I tried it with one unit. And then, you know, it evolved into, into a business. That's it's so interesting to see that everybody kind of gets into it that way. Yeah, totally. I, I, like, this is the last thing in the world I ever would have imagined myself doing. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious, <laughs> isn't it? I talk about Airbnb. Um, never. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, today's topic. So 
uh, we want to, and, and this is something that you've been sharing a lot in, in our, in our Slack community. Uh, you've been sharing a lot about like ideas that you have on, on how can we, how can we bring like a positive change through, for our Airbnbs? How can we help people like make better decisions through, through our Airbnbs? Uh, and you mentioned the concept to me just before we started recording the, the triple bottom line. I've, I've never heard of that before. Like what, what is that exactly? Yeah, so it's basically kind of an economic framework. Um, traditional com- traditionally, companies just want to make money, and that's what they're looking at is profits. And this shifts that from just a sole focus on profits to a sole or a, you know a, a a focus on people, planet, and prosperity. And I I I, I that just really resonated with me um, because I finally have gotten to a point in my business where I can relax a little bit. I felt. I feel pretty stable about the business itself. And I, I'm like, now I'm really focusing on what I can do to give back. And if I can focus on people and planet and prosperity, and notice they use prosperity and not profits. Um, prosperity kind of means increasing everybody's livelihood, not just my own. Um, it, you know, I, it just feels really good to, to start moving in that direction now. And I, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ramble. <laughs> I just, yeah, uh, go for it. I'm going to contract on a property right now. And it, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm trying to build a community on this property, uh, an Airbnb specific community that actually is going to embody these principles. And this is the first time that I've stepped into development. I'm terrified. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm totally overwhelmed, but I want to build something that is a custom built Airbnb community ascribing to those principles um, that I hope can give back as much as possible to my community. Um, and, you know, we'll see where it goes. I got two weeks um, in this due diligence period on the land and um, I got an architect and lenders involved. I got investors, I'm like ready to roll. Um, but, you know, we'll see if we can even do it first. Yeah. What are, what are some ways that, that you're envisioning, like giving, when you say giving back to the community, what are, what are some ways that you think you can, you can do that through, through, that, uh, through those Airbnbs? Well, you know, so I live in a mountain community in Colorado, and basically every mountain community in Colorado has this same problem, which is a lack of affordable housing. And it's honestly, I think it's pretty debatable what that stems from. Um, Probably there's a little bit of short term rentals having to do with it. There's also a housing crash in 2008 that, you know, (laughs) I listened to a great Planet Money podcast explaining this, but that housing crash in 2008 um made it so that it was cheaper to sell your house and buy a new house and so everybody just dumped their homes and uh builders were no longer building homes and so there was this kind of like lost generation of contractors and then we have you know 15 20 years of lost inventory which is now catching up to us so like that's part of the problem there's problems with zoning regulations you can't you know we just now relaxed in estes park we just like a couple of months ago finally relaxed our limitations on uh on like granny units and adus and and it's just like why hasn't that happened 10 or 15 years ago um so but anyway what's a what's a what's an adu um like a a, a accessory dwelling unit you know like somebody converting their garage into a small apartment Uh, okay yeah you know and there have been restrictions on that and that should have those restrictions should have been lifted ages ago and people should have been converting their garages into places where people can live, but we didn't. So anyway, all across the mountain West, we have this problem and, um, you know, and, and maybe Airbnbs are contributing a little bit to it, but let's just assume that they are, what can I do to alleviate that? And, um, so if I'm going to build this thing and basically it's like, Four, or it's a community of eight net zero A-frames, super modern, ascribing to this idea of biophilic design, which we'll get into later because I think it's one of the coolest things ever. Um, so net zero, all solar powered A-frames that produce more than they consume. They produce more electricity that they consume. And I'm working with an architect that can design buildings that um, you can heat with a hairdryer. And so because A-frames don't have a lot of corners in them, they're super efficient. And if we build them in factories in Denver and basically bring them up here and assemble them on site, you're building them in a, in a contained environment. So you can get really, really efficient building. Um, it's like super easy to insulate them because it's in a controlled environment. So these buildings are kind of awesome. So, um, so they're producing more than they consume. They're covered in solar panels. There'd be a back lot 
um, filled with solar. Um, and then there's this other idea called a virtual power plant, which is, <laughs> I'm kind of going off the rails here, but a virtual power plant is kind of like next generation net metering. And so what you do is you cover your house with solar, you have a battery, and then you replace your service panel with a smart service panel. And you have a whole bunch of these things and they all talk to each other. And so traditionally, if, you know, if the electric company sees that it's going to be really cold and everybody's going to fire up their electric baseboard heaters, they're going to anticipate that there's going to be this huge surge on the electric grid and they're going to fire up a natural gas power plant. And that it's called a peaker plant. And it basically provides surplus energy during that surge. And uh, it's dirty and it's expensive to run and it's dirty and really polluting. And if you have a virtual power plant, basically you have all of these homes drawing off each other's batteries in real time instead of the power plant firing this thing up. And so my idea would be to have these A-frames operate as a virtual power plant, you know, as a kind of a proof of concept and eventually scale that up to potentially every Airbnb in my community, which would be amazing. Like I would like to see that happen as part of our permitting process. And, uh, but since they're being able to be heated with a hairdryer, they're still producing a like way more electricity than we need. And we can probably work out a deal with the electric company in the town in the town's utility division and funnel all the profits from that electricity to affordable housing projects. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure what, you know, how that looks yet because there are rules in Colorado about, you know, sending, you can't give somebody free electricity, but you, you know, we might be able to take that money and put it in the town's general fund and then make a donation from the general fund to like the SS Park Housing Authority or something like that. So that's part of it. Um, I'd love to see all of the, you know, all of the gray water funnel down into a community garden in front of this development and grow vegetables for families. Um, I wanna make sure that everybody who works for this development would be getting paid basically better than anybody in a similar job anywhere in my state. Um, you know, I have a meeting with a mayor today to kind of figure out what else we can do. Um, I'm talking to the investors about potentially diverting a percentage of our first year profit to affordable housing projects um, or the SS Park Housing Authority, which might use it for, you know, down payment assistance on a home or building new inventory or providing rent assistance. Like there's so many things we can do. And I'm, I'm still sort of in the brainstorming phase here. But everybody that I've talked to and is on board with this project, like, like I said, from the architect to the lender to the investors, they all are really behind this idea of maximizing the way that we can give back while at the same time um, running a very profitable business. You, you mentioned a lot here. So there's, yeah, there's a couple of things sorry. I want to go, go back to. Uh, first of all, you're saying you can, you can heat up this, these A-frame A uh, units with a hairdryer? Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? Like they they got to so, explain that because I don't understand that. How, how does that yeah, work? It's called, basically, it's called passive house design. And, and you know, they're, they're just they're sited in a way that they um, they're really well insulated and they're placed on the lot in such a way that they maximize solar gain. And so you don't really need a lot of heat in the first place because they're naturally heated and cooled. Um, and so when you say you can heat them with a hairdryer, it's like the amount of energy you need to actually heat this house is what you can produce from a hairdryer. Wow. Well, that's great because I mean, I don't know about about uh, uh, in the US right now. I'm I'm back in in Holland, spend some time with with family here. But elect electricity, energy prices have gone through the roof here. Yeah, is that the same on on the other side of the ocean? Well, it's funny. Everybody complains about electricity in Colorado, but we we basically don't pay anything for a, a kilowatt of electricity. It's it's so cheap compared to how much it costs in like Hawaii. It's like five times cheaper or more. Um, but you know, this is what I'm thinking. If I can somehow generate, you know, two hundred dollars worth at market rate, each one of these homes would be able to generate about two hundred dollars worth a month of electricity. And if I can cut somebody's living expenses by two hundred dollars a month at today's interest rates, that's like shaving one hundred fifty thousand bucks or more off the off of a mortgage. Yeah, yeah, hundred so percent. I don't know of a better way to basically reduce somebody's cost of living by doing yeah. this, you can do it at scale. And if you can build an Airbnb that offsets the electricity cost of an entire family, like that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's definitely a big deal. Yeah, that would be incredible. So you, you, can, you can produce that much electricity with, uh, with those solar panels you're saying, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and because because the uh, the homes are so uh, energy efficient and so well isolated, um, you really you really only need a, a, a fraction of what you're producing to to heat the home. Totally. Yeah, yeah. you know the, the biggest energy con- consumers in a house are basically going to be your you know your, your HVAC system, your water heater, and your oven, and then you know the rest of it's going to be like LED lights and you know a computer maybe a television, although I don't even want a television in these homes. And so if you basically get rid of the need for a heat source, um, you have an oven that Airbnb guests are rarely going to use because they're going to go out to dinner. Um, And you have a a hybrid hot water heater, which uses like a third of the electricity of a regular hot water heater, then you have a ton of surplus energy. So these, these homes are basically power plants. And then the question is, how can we divert that surplus electricity um, to people that need it most. And, you know, yeah. in, in communities, there's this huge poor families tend to live in older buildings that are less insulated and it costs more to heat their buildings and mm-hmm. wealthier families live in newer construction and they don't pay as much for heat and electricity. So <laughs> it's kind of messed up that the poor people need, uh, electricity the most and it costs them the most. Yeah, it's a it's a really uh, it's a really interesting topic right now. Um, you know, energy saving energy, right? I mean, it's 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 been a topic for a while, but especially now in Europe with the energy price because of the what's going on in in Ukraine, like energy prices are so high that um, that there's a, a real focus on like how can we how can we preserve energy, and even here in Holland, the government is putting out these ads educating people on like hey, if you put your your central heating at 19 degrees Celsius, which I think, uh, not not sure exactly, it's probably around 70-ish in, in Fahrenheit. But essentially, if you put it like uh, a couple degrees lower than you usually do, it saves a tremendous amount of energy. Yeah. Right? And they're talking about like showering, for example. It's like, hey, if you if you shower for like five minutes versus like 15 minutes, like how much water and energy you're saving. And I think, you know, I'm... I'm I'm seeing all these ads right now and I'm, I'm starting to, I'm realizing like, Hey, I, I actually don't really, I have no idea how much energy I'm saving. If I turn off a light, for example, or if I shower for five minutes less than I would usually do or put the temperature down a bit. So I think, I think that'd be cool too. Is like in having an Airbnb where you're educating your guests, where you're saying like, Hey, if you, if you shower for five minutes, this is how much energy you're using or for 10 minutes, this is how much and kind of bring some awareness and putting some numbers behind, behind those activities. Yeah. So that's another part of this that I don't want to go into a lot because it's a a really cool idea that I I actually want to develop and deploy on a commercial level. Um, But that is a a critical part of, of this development is basically equipping these homes with, um, educational systems that guide people toward making right the right decisions. And yeah, there's been a lot of research on this. That's, you know, it's part of why we have like, you know, MPG meters in cars. People have realized that in cars, um, if you can tell people in real time, what their miles per gallon is, uh, they're going to, they're going to maximize that. And they're not going to hit the accelerator so much because when they stop on the gas, they see the miles per gallon drop to like four. And when they're a little bit, you know, (laughs) gentle, it's so funny. Yeah. Climbs up to 30. And so, you know, we've seen people um, basically improve their driving habits. Yeah. If you can build that in a house, um, you know, you're going to see kind of the same thing. And I personally think that everybody should be able, like everybody knows the fuel efficiency of their car because they have to go to the gas station and buy gas. Nobody knows how many kilowatt hours of electricity they use in their house. And I think that that's a stat that people should be able to rattle off off the top of their head. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're not conditioned for that in this country or probably anywhere. Um, and I mm-hmm. think that, you know, I, I think that I would like to change that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the, the, uh, the amount of um, gas that you're using in a car. Cause you know, my, my brother lives in Ireland. He's, he's visiting here in, in Holland right now. And he told me he drove, uh, he drove to the airport. It was about an hour and a half. And because the gas prices are so high right now, you know, he was really like thinking like, how can I, how can I drive to the airport and use the least amount of fuel? And so what he did is he actually drove uh, very close to a truck the whole, totally. the whole way, yeah. not, not, as, not so close that it's getting dangerous, but he basically like drove behind a truck and this, this constant speed, 
right? Like constant speed. And he told me he used uh, he used like thirty or forty percent less gas than he use he would usually do on that on that ride because he's done that ride so many times. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, you know, I mean, we there's already companies that are building some of this stuff, um, and like there's a there's a company called I was just reading about it this morning when I woke up um, about these water meters that clamp onto your um, water mains in your house and you know they can sense leaks you know and they 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 somehow sense through the pipe water flow and if there's like this constant dribble of water going through your main water line it'll identify a leak and it uses ai and some of these things can like can start to identify the appliance or the fixture that's leaking or you know it's like oh that was a toilet that flushed or that's a shower um and you know if you can bring that inside the house and start to gamify a, a, a stay and educate people on what they're actually doing. Like, I, I really feel like at scale, you can build homes that really teach people a lot about, a lot about conservation, you know? And, mm -hmm. and like I said, I live in a park town and people, this is a crazy stat. I, I actually, I was like, what's the carbon footprint of just the miles traveled to get to this national park? And it was the equivalent of a 40 mile each year of a, of a 40 mile long train of coal just on fire <laughs> and that's just to travel from where they're coming from to get to our park and the whole pe the, re the whole reason people are coming here is to go walk around in the woods and two years ago my town nearly burned to the ground on my birthday in october and uh you know last year uh you know there was a giant fire in boulder colorado just outside of boulder in december um you know, the world's changing and we're kind of in a, a critical place right now. And, you know, we got to do something about it. And so what can we do with Airbnbs? Because I, I feel like there's so many things that we can do to make the world a better place, but there's something special about Airbnbs because you can scale an idea huge, um, you know, and, and, and you can impact a ton of people and you can impact people who are traveling and, you know, I don't know, my whole life I've been traveling and basically photographing rock climbing. Um, my life before I was an Airbnb guy was I would shoot weddings in the summer and then all winter long, I would travel the world and, and photograph rock climbing. And basically, I, I it dawned on me that like, man, the miles that I've traveled is insane to basically go recreate. And how do I reckon it? But at the same time, I've like I've seen new experiences. I've met new people. I've met new ways of being and living and how do I reconcile these two things like this, like human need to travel and the, like the damage that I'm doing. And that's kind of led me to this place where I'm at now. You watch a documentary about the free climbers. Yeah. What's that? Uh, what's that famous wall? I think it's in Colorado. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's in Yellowstone. This is famous wall that they always talk about. Oh, El Cap. You know that one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. That was called yeah. the Don Wall. The Don Wall. Actually, Tommy, um, Tommy Caldwell lives in Estes and he's might be involved a little bit to some degree with with some of the stuff we're working on, which is really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. No, that that documentary just blew my mind. Um, just to see like these guys climbing without any ropes or anything like that. It's pretty amazing. Well, that, uh so yeah, that was Alex Honnold um free soloing L, L Cap which yeah. is another <laughs> I, have, I have fear of heights. So like when I watch that, I'm just like, I just cannot imagine like anybody doing that. This is yeah. so insane to me. Yeah, anyway, me. that's a whole different story. But um, um, listen, I want to, I want to go into the bio biophilia. I never heard of that word. That's the second, second word I learned in, in this podcast um, after triple bottom line. <laughs> what, what's biophilia? So this is, I, I just, I, I'm fascinated by this. Um, and maybe it was, you know, from my background as a science writer. And I, 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 I love the intersection between art and science. And I think this embodies it in a building and a design perspective. But basically, there's this idea that humans evolved, um, you're co-evolved in nature. We are outside creatures. And now we live 90% of our time in buildings. And that's not the way that we came to be. Um, and so there's a ton of research that shows that that if you can bring elements of the outside inside, you're more relaxed, you're less stressed, you're more productive, you're more you're happier. Um, basically, life is better um, if you can build buildings that make you feel like you're outside. And you know, like in my town, 
and probably all over the place, people just think that they can build an Airbnb and call it good. You know, you, you put some furniture in it from Ikea and that's it. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm envisioning building an experience in these buildings. People are coming to my town because they want to be outside. Well, what if I can build buildings that make them feel like they're outside when they're not outside? So they're outside the entire time. And so, um, Google, you know, like big companies now are starting to in integrate biophilic design into their office buildings and they'll put green walls up, they'll design like structures that cast shadows through through the office building so that people can sense, um, you know, they, they see the shadow moving across their office and they sense time changing, uh, you know, they'll work with the way that the air flows through the building so it's either hot or cool and it feels like morning or afternoon or night. And they just give people this kind of like deep feeling and they don't even know what they're, you know, sometimes some of these features, like people don't even know that they're happening, but at the end of the day, they've seen productivity raise um, and their, and their workers are doing a better job. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, that's what part of what I want to do with these buildings. And, you know, I, I, it would go so far as to like diverting rainwater from your rain gutters, like into a building and into a waterfall feature inside so that when it's storming outside, well, you're going to go inside, you're going to seek shelter, but then you're going to have that water coming through your rain gutters, coming through waterfalls in your building, and you're going to hear it and you're going to smell, you're going to smell the water. You know, you can smell these rainstorms in Colorado. It's an amazing experience. And so if you, if you really like get people's senses involved in their stay, like, I, I feel like at the end of that stay, they're going to be like, wow, what just happened? You know, and they're going to be more involved in, in the stay and the experience. And I think that's going to, and they're going to be more present, I think. And I think that that's going to clue them into a lot of the other stuff that I was talking about earlier about like educating them toward or guiding them toward using less because if you can, if you can feel the beauty of this area that you're in, I think you're going to be tied to it a little bit more and, and want to mm -hmm. care about it a little bit more. You know, I stayed at an Airbnb once where there was literally, there was a tree in the air, inside of the Airbnb, at least like the trunk okay. was inside of the Airbnb. Yeah, man. I mean, how did it make you feel? Was it cool? I thought, it, yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just I've never seen that before, you know. So at first, I thought like, oh, is this a fake tree or something? Um, and I realized like, oh, this is an actual. This is an actual tree that's in in the Airbnb, you know. Um, which yeah, I thought it was really. I thought it was really interesting. Definitely made me. Definitely like changed the experience. So let me ask you a question then, since you guys are working on, you know, on your free, free wild project um, and it's a, you, you have identified this as an important part of the experience, right? Yeah. And have, have you guys pulled, like, where are you guys going with this in, in terms of pulling these natural uh, elements into your, into your designs mm -hmm. and structures? Yeah, that's a really good question, and uh, we're we're still we're still working on that because um, right now, like we're we're basically running the the units uh, as we as we bought them. Yeah. Um, so we're like, and that's mostly uh, Eric. Uh, Eric is doing that. Eric's kind of the visionary of the of the two of us. So he's working really on the design. We've you know we're working with the different design companies and stuff. So uh, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure yet uh, to tell you the truth. But just having like something different, you know, you, like <laughs> just not having a building with a bunch of Ikea furniture in it, but having some sort yeah. of more natural experience and natural stay. Um, I, I feel like it really shifts people's mindsets. Um, it did for me. I remember I went on a climbing trip. So when this all started percolating for me, I was on a climbing trip in Spain and I wound up, I remember, man, I got on the airplane and Google photos, like, you know, it, it geo tracks your photos. Our G it has like a GPS um, GPS coordinate on your photos. And it's like, wow, you've traveled three times around the world this last year. And I'm like, wow, that's really messed up. <laughs> you know, like that's a crazy amount of impact I've had to go recreate basically and photograph people recreating. And so we wound up in Spain in this little village, um, you know, and we stayed in an Airbnb that had basically no heat and like, one tiny little oven and a couple of light bulbs in it. And I'm like, wow, like I'm now I'm not using anything. This is great. I walk to the crags every day. 
barely drove anywhere, walked to the grocery store, except a couple of times we would go to the big city and do like big, big grocery runs. And I remember coming back and it was this beautiful sunset and we drove through a wind farm and I was just like, man, I got to get out and go check this out. And I just spent like spent the sunset in this wind farm. And instead of like this big factory belching out smoke, I just heard this. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is the future. You know, six of these windmills could power my entire town. And that got me really thinking about carbon footprint of traveling and, and, you know, just this huge, you know, difference between this Airbnb that I was staying in where I was basically using nothing. And then the Airbnbs that I run back at home, you know, where people show up and it's like, I can't even believe the stuff that people are doing sometimes, you know, we'll get these complaints about it being too cold and I'll go over there and they've got the heat blasted up to 86 degrees and the windows are open, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, they're constantly running out of the hot water in the 80 gallon water tank, the 80 gallon hot water tank. And it's just, you know, people go on vacation sometimes. And I feel like they bring their baggage with them and, and leave their, their brains at home. And, um, yeah, it's, 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 I think it's got to change. You know, it's funny, um, when you book a flight right now in certain airlines, um, I know KLM, which is the Dutch airline, he, they, they have this option. You can, they actually show you the, the carb, the carbon footprint of your, uh, of, of the flight that you're booking. And then yeah. you can pay extra to, to essentially fly net zero. Yeah. It's, yeah. Go ahead. I think that's, um, well, I think that's, I mean, I think that's, uh, it's interesting because like, that's also what we are talking about before. It's like, I think step one is like bringing awareness, right? Like actually measuring things and showing people. And I don't know. And, and I know you don't want to dive too, too deep into your, your new project when it comes to this. But um, what I was kind of imagining is like, is like, as you're living in a house, like constantly like seeing a number or something where it's like, oh, you know, you know what I mean? So that people, people just understand. And then it becomes fun because then you can be like, oh, what can I do to bring this number down? You know, what can I do to get my footprint down, my carbon footprint down? Yep. Yep. And, and, and I think, you know, and that goes totally like having constant feedback is really important because you finally, you finally see what you're actually doing. I had a great experience, uh, in, in Europe feeding a wood stove, <laughs> actually, that taught me a whole lot about heat, you know, because in America, you just go push a button and you get heat and it's magic. You just, you, you push a button on your thermostat and then suddenly hot air is coming out of a vent. And, and there's this total disconnect um, between your action and what's, and, and what's happening because of that action. Um, feeding a wood stove, when you walk out into the snow and you freeze and you, and you know, get snow in your boots, and then you bring all this wood back in, inside and you constantly have to feed this wood stove and you watch the wood pile dwindle, like it really, you know, that experience alone starts to connect the dots between just watching the wood pile dwindle, you know, it's like, wow, it, it took this much stuff to heat this house for this long. <laughs> and suddenly you start to see the consequence of your action. And that's called feedback. And if mm -hmm. you can provide that in a building, well, you've gone a long way. And, and you've, we've already shown that you can, you know, providing that feedback can alter people's behavior and in, in travel and the way they drive, the way they fly, whatever. So I, I think that's really important. And, and yeah, like, it's like, <laughs> that's going to be part of this project. I just don't, uh, I don't want to go into the details because I'm still working on it. <laughs> <yet. laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't let anyone steal your idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, man. Cool. This is uh, yeah, this has been really interesting. Uh, time time flies as always on on this podcast. So we're getting to uh, getting to the end. Um, before before I let you go, um, let us know a little bit more about your business and how we can how we can find you if we want to stay in Colorado or if we have a house there that we want somebody to manage. Um, yeah, it's just thewolfrentals.com, and uh, that's how you find me shoot me a message on the wolf rentals.com. Awesome. The wolf rentals.com. Well, that's easy enough. Sweet man. Well, any final, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap this up? Uh, geez, not really. I, you know, like I said, I think this biophilia is really important because it sets somebody's mood. I, one of the things I learned as a wedding photographer, um, I, I sat down and, and, and read a bunch of research on 
how to get people in a mood, <laughs> you know, and how to get them to react to an idea. And through photography, it was as, you know, it was, I, I can get people when they're looking at a portfolio, I can change their mood by showing them particular images with shapes and colors and micro expressions on people's faces. And I redid my portfolio because I wanted people when they're looking at my portfolio to feel a certain way. And then that would make the purchasing decision based on a feeling instead of a, a dollar sign. And I think that's really important. And so part of the idea with this, this project is with biophilic design, if I can put people in a mood and give them a feeling about their stay, then I think they're going to be more apt to support, uh, you know, some of the change initiatives that I want to bring into this day. Mm -hmm. If they're yeah. happy and they're less stressed out, but they don't even know why, but they're in this house and they just feel a sense of calm and a sense of reverence for the nature that's inside that house and the nature that they're looking at outside the window and the nature that they just walk through all day long. I think they're going to feel more inclined to protect that. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. that's really important. 100% man makes a lot of sense. Dude, I'm really excited. Uh, excited to see uh, where you're gonna take this, man. This is uh, this is really exciting stuff. Um, so definitely keep us posted. Uh, maybe we'll have you back uh, on the podcast in uh, in a while. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully the, in a year or so, we can uh, we can maybe uh, start staying at some of those units. They're gonna be cool. I know we talked a lot about carbon footprint, and energy use, but you know, like like I said, it's gonna be really important also to use this development to. Um, make it more affordable to live in my town. And I just, you yeah. know, details of that are still to be worked out, but we'll see how it goes. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for, yeah. uh, yeah. Thanks for jumping on the podcast. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, excited to, uh, to hang out in, uh, in, in Mexico in the mass mind. Yeah. And, um, yeah, to the listeners, thank you for listening. And of course, we'll be back next week with another episode. So see you then.